white nose is something I don't think we ever thought as wildlife managers we'd be dealing with. And it's huge. It's a condition that's affecting hundreds of thousands of cave bats in the Northeast. And it's the fungus that grows on the bats, often near the muzzle, hence the name white nose syndrome. And in, for some reason, the bats are burning up all their fat during the winter time and literally starving to death before spring when the insects are out and they can replenish their food supplies. And the ones that survive the winter with white nose can actually come out of hibernation and make some recovery. Their body temperature is up, their immune system's going, they can fight off the fungus, but there doesn't seem to be any immunity. When they go back into hibernation again, they're just as likely to get white nose. And for as long as we have the right conditions, cold caves with hibernating bats, there doesn't seem to be anything that's going to stop this from spreading. There are 45 species of bats that live in North America. About 23 of those are hibernating species, so they would all be susceptible to dying due to white nose syndrome. And the Indiana bat was one of the first endangered species ever listed in the United States. There were about 900,000 Indiana bats, which sounds like a lot, but actually the populations had already drastically declined. And then around the early 2000s, we actually started to see some modest increases in the populations of Indiana bats. And then unfortunately, that's when white nose syndrome came into the picture. And now we feel like we're really just fighting to keep these bats from extinction. There were four sites in New York where white nose syndrome was first identified three winters ago. Bats were flying outside in the daylight in the middle of the winter, which are dead bats essentially. Now this winter, it's in nine states in the Northeast, and so uh, we do feel it will show up in, in the Midwest as well as moving into the Southeast. And so here in the Midwest, Indiana bats are in their largest numbers. And most of the sites are in a pretty small area. So once white nose syndrome would reach Indiana, it would spread through our bat populations pretty quickly. And that means that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has authorities and responsibilities under the Endangered Species Act to, to deal with um, Indiana bat. And we have recently issued a cave advisory asking for a voluntary moratorium on caving in all states affected by white nose syndrome not thinking that it's going to stop it. What we're trying to do there is, is buy some time and keep it out of sites in the Midwest and the Southeast for as long as we can so that by the time it, it reaches these areas, we'll know as much as we can on how to control white nose at that point. I'd say that if there's any highlight, uh, it is the level of cooperation that people across federal agencies, state agencies, the caving community and conservation community Everybody has really brought the resources to the table and it's been a good motivation to keep us going. And now there are several labs that are looking at this and one of them is the USGS National Wildlife Health Lab in Madison. And they're trying to get a handle on how is this spread and what is the cause? Is the fungus the only thing involved? And if that is the issue we're dealing with. This fungus is anything but your typical fungus and bats are anything but your typical warm-blooded mammal. So for example, bats spend half of their lifetime hibernating. And during hibernation, a bat drops its core body temperature to within about a degree of the cave. And they suspend portions of their immune system to actually conserve energy. So now you have bats, they could be completely healthy bats, naturally immunosuppressed, essentially sleeping, and very low body temperature, conducive to the conditions under which this fungus grows. And the bats are essentially just getting moldy almost akin to a forgotten tub of cottage cheese that you may have left in the back of your refrigerator. And obviously bats have evolved over millions of years to hibernate in moist, dark, cool caves that provide rich environments for fungi. But what we suspect is that this fungus has recently been introduced into caves and is now causing this problem in bats, which are a naive host and essentially a very good source of growth medium for this fungus. We do have groups working on different potential control strategies, but I fear that the reality of it is is that it's very difficult to control once it's out of the bottle in a free-ranging wildlife population. If this was bird flu and this was a poultry farm with a million chickens, a 10-mile perimeter would be drawn around that farm and every chicken within that perimeter would be killed. 
the farm would be disinfected using means that would be wholly un inappropriate for caves because if we try to kill a pathogenic fungus, we're also killing all of the other fungi and bacteria that are part of the healthy microflora of that cave. So it's very tricky. I think that at, at the moment, the only management tool that we have in our box right now for controlling white nose syndrome is containment and not spreading it outside of the area where bats can spread it. If I had to come up with a couple of short words to describe white nose syndrome, I would describe it as an ecological disaster. I don't even think we can begin to predict what the effects of loss of 90% of our bat populations might be. So I think in the long run, if we lose most of our bats, that we'll be losing the major predator of the night flying insects out there. And we're looking, at this point, Fish and Wildlife Service estimates 400,000 bats have been lost to white nose. And each of those bats in the summertime is eating half its body weight in insects. That's 800,000 grams of insects. So, I mean, we're talking many tons of insects each night. In addition to what happens outside of the cave if we lose the bats, what happens inside the cave if we lose the bats? There are whole communities of animals adapted to living in cave environments that depend on bats in a lot of cases to bring nutrients into the cave. If we lose a large enough part, a population of our bats, it may reduce the amount of organic matter that's being brought in by these bats. So there may be other critters that are affected. Some of these are very rare, found in one or two caves in the world, and they could easily be lost. Over 400,000 bats have died since white nose hit. 25,000 of those have been Indiana bats. And so when you have a federally endangered species and that many are dying, it just goes to the core of the mission of the Forest Service to do whatever we can do to slow the spread of the, the transmission of white nose syndrome until the scientists can find out more about it. What we're looking at is possible cave and mine closures to find out the answers to what's causing it. The National Speleological Society, the New England Cave Conservancy, the Southeast Cave Conservancy have all closed some of their managed or owned caves. And the caving community is very supportive of the efforts to slow the spread of white nose syndrome and give us a chance to find more out about this fungus and the disease. It's just, I think, a good indication of what happens when you bring something foreign in that the ecosystem's not set to deal with. It's something that throws things out of balance, and eventually there'll be a new balance. That new balance may be we've lost a lot of species of bats before things settle out, or it might be we have much reduced populations of bats. This obviously will not be the end of the world, but it's going to change the world.